Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Rob Melnick, Executive Dean of the Global Institute of Sustainability at Arizona State University. The Global Institute was established in 2007 and was the first school of sustainability in the country for advancing research, education, and business practices for an urbanizing world. Rob Melnick has led the Institute since 2008. He was previously director of the Morrison Institute for Public Policy at ASU and director and vice president of the Hudson Institute in New York. Rob Melnick has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Rob, for joining us today. It's good to see you, Mark. So sustainability is such a broad concept, and it seems that everything has sustainability added to it as an adjective uh, today. This is completely different. It is an institute for sustainability. It is here at ASU. Talk about how ASU and, and this institute see sustainability. Well, in short, we see sustainability as the future. How do we ensure a prosperous future for people locally, nationally, and throughout the world? Sustainability, as you said, was a term that no one used, say, six, seven years ago, and now everybody uses. And so the meaning to some has been diluted. The reality is the common theme for people who use sustainability, whether it's in academia or in nonprofit or in government or in business, is how to ensure a prosperous future without um, taxing unduly uh, the generations that will come after us. In ways of thinking, you're talking about a number of different concepts here. Starting things that you actually can complete. You're talking about shifting cycles from feast and famine, feast and famine, whether it's in our economic cycle. You're talking about relationships. You're talking about financial sustainability. It's, it's really an umbrella to cover all these aspects. Yeah, it's, it's kind of all of the above. I mean, the, the three so-called pillars of sustainability are economic, environmental, and social. That's sort of the common, common thinking about this. And some people think when we're, we're talking about sustainability at university and we cover all this ground that you mentioned, well, what's the difference between that and liberal arts? The essential difference is we look at the interaction among those three things and then we try to come up with solutions to problems. So sustainability at the end of the day is solution focused. There's a challenge to the environmental quality of the planet or your neighborhood. Uh, there's a challenge to social equity in your state or your region. Uh, there's a challenge to economic growth and sustainable development. How do you then balance knowledge with action so that we can sustain and maintain a, a prosperous future? That's really kind of what it's about. What's also very interesting is that you, you uh, take ideas that have their genesis in biblical times where at that, at that time it was the word of God mm -hmm. to rotate your crops. Mm -hmm. um, and you go into the future and you find that when people stop rotating your crops, uh, fields end up becoming um, destroyed and depleted. And then there's a recovery idea. So then we had this whole idea of the Dust Bowl and, and trying to recover um, uh, misused, unsustainable practices. Um, and, and there was almost a separation of, of daily practice and some expert was going to come in and sort of tell you what to do to recover. But your approach is to integrate sustainable thinking into every act, into every consumption into every product that you buy, into every product that you produce as a business. It's, it, it, it is a significant shift in, in how one behaves on a daily basis. Well, the key word is behavior. Um, at the end of the day, you know, people think about sustainability uh, sometimes as, well, the government's going to take care of it, or the government's going to screw things up, or big business is responsible for polluting the planet or whatever. The reality... Bad, 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 right? right? All, all this finger pointing. Right. And, and what you're saying is, no, it's, it's all us, it's good us. and bad. It's six billion people making choices, right. basically, and at all ends of the spectrum. And um, just because we do uh, things a little differently, it may not be enough. As uh, Bill McDonough, one of our board members, uh, the, the author of Cradle to Cradle, describes that he's got a wonderful phrase for it. He says, less bad is still bad. And, and so we've got to start thinking about how we behave as individuals, as community leaders, as educators, as business people, and, and, and just as, as neighbors, if you will. My favorite definition of sustainability actually is uh, Peter Senge's uh, definition. He, it's, it's elegant. 
he simply says sustainability is living together well. Living together well. It's an elegant phrase because it talks about well-being for everybody, but also the fact that everyone's involved and your behaviors, sustainable or not, affect my behaviors. So you're absolutely right. We're, we're not Pollyannas. We're not out to preach. We're out to show people relationships between their behavior and the future of the planet or their behavior and the future of their community. And, and we have a lot of challenges on this planet. A lot of sustainability scientists, as they're called these days, term of art, think of what we're now, we've now entered is called the Anthropocene era. The Anthropocene era is a very simple concept also. It's the era in which we recognize that man affects what happens on this planet. And the examples you gave before about people don't rotate their crops or they, or they uh, do things that are not sustainable, for example, pouring chemicals on their crops, ad infinitum and polluting the rivers downstream as right. a result, you can't do that forever. You can't do that forever. But for a long time, people did those kinds of they things. They were cost shifting. They were basically yeah. shifting Absolutely. costs someplace else and taking benefit here. Right. And, and, and that is, you know, the idea of behaving in a way that you can capture more resource yourself and then move costs into somebody else, that has been a, a big part of how we have we have acted. It's it, it's the plastics revolution. Sure, and and it's it's in you know people thought this was an economic imperative to grow. Bigger is better. Well, the reality is I'm not a big subscriber to you know big businesses is, is uh, malevolent and they polluted the planet. They don't care and they're greedy. I don't I don't buy that at all. I think there was an enormous amount of ignorance for a long time during manufacturing error. A lot of the environmental problems we have, I think, didn't come from malicious behavior. Came from ignorance, and it came from the way we always did things. And it was it was our ignorance. Yeah. We, we own that exactly. So now you have to sort of belly up to the bar and say, okay, we had problems. Let's not point fingers. Let's get on with solutions. And in a sense, what what we're trying to do is educate a future generation to kind of clean up the act, literally and figuratively, and realize that they're really, you know, it's not so much a zero-sum game. We can all live better together. We just have to sort out the ways in which we do that. It's very practical, actually. So how does that map into a university, which is organized into departments, into English, mathematics, physics, um, and then you have sustainability, which is about a whole different way of thinking? Well, um, your point is very well taken. One of the big challenges in any university is is breaking out of the so-called silo effect, where um, one college doesn't necessarily interact with another and one discipline doesn't interact with another. And the reward systems, in fact, in most universities are based just that way. If you publish or teach in your discipline, you will be rewarded. The moment you cross the boundary, you're in someone else's turf. Yet life doesn't work that way. No. You, you, you don't live a mathematical life. Right, and real world problems, again, environmental, social, economic, what, whatever they may be, do not respect academic disciplines. So sustainability is a horizontal concept in the university. So if you look at my faculty, you'll find they're extremely eclectic. We have people from the hard sciences, technology, engineering. We have people from anthropology, from the humanities. We have people from psychology. You name it, basically. And in our faculty, we also have not only uh, regular faculty, if you will, full-time faculty who are faculty of the School of Sustainability, but we literally have 250 affiliates that are officially associated with, uh, with our school from throughout the university, reflecting the complexities of the challenges of sustainability and therefore the solutions. In many respects, you can, you can no longer create walls around this topic area because the topic area itself defies uh, that type of comfortable definition. Sustainability is about crossing boundaries, basically. Um, it doesn't respect boundaries and uh, nor should it, the, the approach to knowledge and research and application and education about it. So we're kind of reinventing education in a, in a way in which it will appeal to students who are interested in lots of different things under an umbrella of sustainability. And we offer at, at ASU, we offer majors in sustainability, those people who want to really dedicate their careers to finding solutions to sustainability challenges. But we also offer minors in sustainability that go along with more traditional fields, engineering, business, public administration. Talk about how that maps into a sure. career thinking of, of senior students who are preparing for graduation. Well, it, it maps in two ways. First of all, it focuses their attention on certain challenges. And secondly, it provides opportunities to solve problems. So let's take engineering. A good example would be we have a program in, at ASU 
that used to be called civil engineering, and now it's got a longer, fancier title, but it's still at the end of the day, civil engineering. How do you build and engineer th things, things, buildings right. and Structures bridges and, and things like that. Waterways. And right, so all of those things. Now you overlay sustainability on it, and the question becomes, now how do you build a building so that it'll stand up and not fall down, which is a good start, right? But how will you design it so that it will use very little energy, it will recycle its water, it will produce very limited waste, so that the building itself is sustainable, and in fact, even, even has an environment which is friendly to people inside, which is part of sustainability. And doesn't that make the desert the perfect place to have that, where there is not that many, uh, the, the environment is very sensitive, water is not abundant, um, where uh, resources um, are, are really need to be carefully uh, harnessed? Well, the desert is a perfect laboratory for this. Um, uh, and so there's no accident we have a School of Sustainability and an Institute of Sustainability in, in Phoenix uh, and throughout the Phoenix metropolitan area. We're sitting in a metropolitan area of four and a half million people that without principles of sustainability, engineering, technology, as well as social, would not be here today. Simple as that. Beyond uh, the, the obvious um, uh, example of, of a building and the use of water and so on, could you cite a couple of other examples of this uh, idea of, of helping people to think into the future? Sure. Well, I'll give you two di very different examples. One is a program that we have actually funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, it's just simply called the GK-12 program. What it amounts to is our graduate students spend two years in local high schools teaching teachers how to teach environmental science and sustainability and working with their communities to develop everything from recycling programs to community gardens. And what we're doing is we're creating a teaching learning opportunity for students, parents, and high school teachers in this area uh, that will focus on principles of sustainability and community well-being. And the whole idea is community because high schools define communities in many ways. Another example is we're working um, on a project with 77, now I believe it is, Fortune 1000 companies, looking at how they can index or label their products using scientific methods to enable consumers to understand if they're buying sustainably produced products or not. Well, that's interesting. So, so you're engaging businesses in a practice that will then affect their entire way of thinking while they're also trying to help you to affect your students. That's, that's exactly right. It's a, it's a very um, sort of a mutually beneficial cycle and relationship. Um, what consumers are, are known to do at this point based on market research is many consumers will spend up to about 10 to 12 percent on products they perceive to be friendly to the environment, sustainable. In this case, sustainability extends beyond in our work to just simply whether it's a green product or not. It also extends to whether or not child labor was involved, principles of sort of social equity and things like that. Very comprehensive. Businesses realize that there's a competitive advantage if their product is next to a, another product by a competitor on a shelf and their product price being relatively similar is sustainable or perceived sustainable by the consumer. What that in turn does is it changes the way the company produces, manufactures, ships, delivers, advertises, which then in turn makes their products more attractive to the people they sell them to upstream and downstream. By creating this kind of virtuous cycle with these companies, we're helping, if you will, the world to become a more sustainable place, use less resources. We're giving consumers more choices about whether or not they value um, uh, sustainable products. That's kind of a value judgment, if you will, and a lifestyle choice. And we're giving our graduate students and undergraduates an opportunity to interact with these businesses that are thinking about sustainability. So it's a very beneficial uh, relationship with these businesses. Talk about some of the projects that you are undertaking as mm -hmm. part of this uh, of this uh, Institute of Sustainability. Well, I mean, we've got lots of different projects because all of our students have to have field experience in order to graduate. You cannot take a, a, a bachelor's degree or a graduate degree from the School of Sustainability without having an internship or, a, or what's called a capstone experience where you actually work with a city, a business, a community, a neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. One of the projects that, um, that I, I particularly like is something called the Sustainable Cities Network. What we discovered was that most cities 
have exactly the same challenges in sustainability. They want to be more uh, powered by renewables. They want to use less water. They want their communities to develop soundly and safely. They want to be secure. These are sort of basic functions of cities. Now we call them under the sustainability umbrella for the most part. Having said that, most cities don't know how to solve those problems. They're not in those businesses. They're in the business of delivering services. It's different than solving problems. What we realized was big or small, um, you know, rich or poor, these cities face the same problem. So what we did is we, at the Institute, became the focal point for, in this case, in our area, 23 cities and some tribes and a county government to share the knowledge among cities that have, in fact, solved sustainability problems. In some cases, we, we put them together. Cities are naturally competitive, especially in Arizona, because sales tax revenue right. drives uh, a lot of the city uh, revenue streams. But we put them together so that they can create critical mass for buying. Why should, why should city A buy uh, solar panels from a company and city B buy from the same company, as opposed to A and B getting together and getting a cost break because they can buy more? Right. So that's one of the practical projects. We've had our students working on this to help solve tangible city problems, make them more sustainable. And then you also have the cross-fertilization between the urban environments and, and rural environments. The model seemed to used to be that the cities consumed what was supplied by the outskirting delivery system, right. whether it was water from the Catskills delivered to New York City or energy supplied through uh, high-tension uh, electrical uh, delivery systems the, uh, to the grid. Um, you had this, this idea of cities consuming, and now cities are beginning to learn from their rural brethren to recycle, well, to, and, and to compost, to, um, to supply ur through urban gardening. Well, what uh, they're realizing, needs. in addition to those things, which are good examples, they're realizing more and more that urban well-being, which means a lot of different things, not the least of which is economic well-being, actually depends on the health of rural areas. So, for example, here in Arizona, water is something you mentioned before. Water comes to the urban areas from the rural areas. Without water, Arizona's done. It's pretty simple. We also have a very uh, high degree of dependence on the rural areas for recreational opportunities. So if the rural areas aren't viable, neither are the urban areas because their amenities are dependent on rural areas. As the world urbanizes, and for the first time in history in 2008, there are more people living in cities in the plan on the planet than outside the cities. And in Arizona, we're about 80% or more uh, urbanized. Okay, We are utterly dependent in the cities on the rural areas. That was very misunderstood for a very long time, was taken for granted. Now we have, of course, in, in academia, we have a term for everything. This is called ecosystem services. The services provide by the natural ecology of the environment to the cities, be they timber, be they plants, and, and uh, be they food, be they water, and, and in the case of water, hydro, power, et cetera, et cetera. Now what's happening, in fact, we have another project, an example of a project where some of our best economists are working with our ecologists and our biologists to figure out what is the net value of the ecosystem services supplied by certain, if you will, valleys and, and rural areas to Arizona cities, which has heretofore been very misunderstood, in fact, taken for granted. Is this sustainability thinking a, a thinking that um, can be exported beyond the borders of Arizona, of, of the United States, is, does this make us into a stronger international uh, player in certain respects? The answer is without question, yes. So it's my job to sort of keep us in the lead, whatever that means. <laughs> you know, I'm not interested in cornering the market on sustainability. I don't know even what that would, what that would amount to. Um, frankly, what I'm interested in is, um, this is why it's so exciting, this Walton grant, is it's the first grant we've had of size and that's not tied down to research. Now the thing is, we've got ways of getting money for research because we're very competitive right, in, right. in proposal writing, you know, and that sort of stuff. It gives me the opportunity to give our students, principally, and our faculty, experiences they cannot have anywhere else. I'll be setting up three solution centers for sustainability problems on on three different continents, and I'll be able mm -hmm. to fund my students to go and spend time in these places, solving problems in other parts, other cultures. That's cool. What's interesting is that on the one hand, the U.S is exporting sustainability knowledge because we're a knowledge-based you know, economy and society. So I've just come back, for example, from a developing country that is keenly concerned about, first and foremost, about 
its development. It wants to grow. Its average um, per capita income is $3,000 a year. By any Western standard, that would be pretty low. They have the potential to double that, but they are doing it right now at the expense of their environment, which will eventually come back and bite them, and it'll, it'll retard their growth over time. And they time. know this. They recognize this, but they don't know how to make it work. Okay? Okay. So on the one hand, this is good, and the fact that I'm able to go there with my students and faculty makes us sort of a, a more international player in sustainability. On the other hand, when you go to Europe, you find the EU countries are way ahead of us on most sustainable sort of issues, way ahead of us, because they've had to be, because they are not as wealthy, they're not as resource rich as the US, and things that we've taken for granted for a long time that we're now having to conserve, European countries have been doing a very good job of it for quite a while. And they're exporting products that are based on sustainability, whether it is more efficient gas heaters, or approaches to delivering uh, water, recycling technology, electric cars, and those kinds of, of technologies are becoming engines of growth, whereas they used to be uh, manufacturing heavy equipment. Right. Um, as they have been overtaken by places like China, mm -hmm. they've shifted their economy to a different base. And you see uh, economies like Germany uh, thriving in this economic downturn based in part of, uh, upon that thinking that, that started years ago. Germany is the poster child for this. Who would have ever thought that the world leader in solar power would be Germany? Germany. Where it's gray all the time. You know, <laughs> you don't get a lot of sun. But in, in almost 40 years ago, they made a very conscious decision to become less dependent on conventional technology, to be more green, and to focus their economic well-being on something other than just heavy industry, which was the legacy of, frankly, World War II. And so when you go to Germany now, you see windmills, you see solar power everywhere. They have on an order of more than 10 times the percentage of total power than the United States does coming from renewables. And at the same time, they've created about 350,000 jobs in the solar industry, high paying jobs. They're also, as you mentioned, really the most economically stable country in all of Europe. So they have been able to sort of do good and do well at the same time. And there's other examples in Europe that are, that are not quite as extreme as Germany, but good examples of them being sort of ahead of us. Having said that, we're all in this together. This is one planet. Okay, we share these resources. And again, I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna or, or, or a left-wing liberal that's you know, an environmental <laughs> tree hugger. I'm trying to be very practical about this. Um, at present consumption rates per capita, this is well known, well known in the scientific community, at present consumption rates of basic things, air, water, land, um, those sorts of things, power, okay? We will need two and a half Earths to supply the materials we need by the year 2060. We don't happen to have an extra Earth and Earth. a half around. So you've got a couple choices. You can cut back or you can stop people from having babies. Now, the latter is very hard to do, especially you know, in developing countries and, and, um, and in developed countries. So if we're going to have a population that's going to move from six to nine billion over the next 45 years, they're going to consume more just by the fact that there's so many more people. Unless they consume at a per capita rate much less than we do today, it's, it's just a mathematical, it's a matter of math. And there's no technology at the end of the day that's going to create more, certain, more of certain things. More stuff. Yeah, there's only so much water out there, right? I mean, we're not going to desalinate the entire ocean. So even, even when you factor in technological advances and are optimistic about that, you still are left with a very great challenge of per capita consumption. Well, isn't this, though, one of our great strengths? If you look at the history of industrial progress uh, and economic progress in the U.S., it really does play to our strength. This, this idea of sustainability is as American as apple pie in, mm -hmm. in so many different respects. That is how we are. And, and it seems to me that your institute is in many respects taking back territory that we've uh, neglected for some time. Well, that's, a, that's a, a kind and thoughtful way to say it, but I, I would agree with you. In fact, one of the things that we're doing um, next week is we're co-hosting with um, uh, the chief administrator of the uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, a conference with about 500 people, about 300 of which will be very senior business leaders on sustainability and, and innovation. 
in part because people think of EPA as a regulator when in fact a lot of what EPA is doing is environmental technology. Environmental technology and technology in general is about American ingenuity, as they say. Yes. Just what, like you said. And so we're linking in our work the concepts of innovation, entrepreneurship, and sustainability. Um, the technologies, though, in and of themselves will not solve the problems. It's how we apply the technologies and how we behave with those technologies in place. Rob Melnick, thank you so much for sharing this with us. The, the future of this institute is, is so interesting because it is developed extraordinarily rapidly. We'll be watching very closely as you cultivate the Institute of Sustainability at Arizona State University over the next years. Thank you so much for your insights. You're welcome. It's a pleasure speaking to you, Marcus.